Hi friends, as promised, here's the second part of an eight-part series titled Hidden Truth. Uh, thanks for taking the time to study with me, to watch these videos, and I hope we learn a lot together. Before I get started, I'd like to uh, make a shout out to my great friend and brother in Christ, Greg. Greg has a uh, YouTube ministry over at Truth Star, Truth Star Productions and uh, he's been making some fantastic videos and I highly suggest you go over there and check him out. Um, as we get into the nuts and bolts of what it means to rightly divide the Word of God in 2 Timothy 2.15 we read Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, lately I've been hearing a lot of uh, rumors going around on the internet, a lot of contradiction based on the Apostle Paul and who he was. And contrary to, contrary to popular belief, the Apostle Paul was not a Gentile. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. There's a certain uh, self-proclaimed pastor on YouTube and uh, he's declaring just yesterday that the apostle Paul was a Gentile and not a Jew. This is just one of many false teachings out there in YouTube land and I really don't have time to go through and list them all and waste time. Uh, exposing people and backstabbing and calling people names and you know accusing people of stealing money from subscribers and I refuse to be one of these people on YouTube who constantly begs people for money then turns around and uh, completely ridicules other people on YouTube that are doing the the very same thing that to me is called unrighteous judgment and believe it or not, there's another person on YouTube, another self-professed uh, pastor, and she's telling her subscribers that she needs $50,000 a month to run a YouTube ministry. And I find that very hard to believe. Trust me, folks, if it costs me $50,000 a month to do what I'm doing, you wouldn't be watching this video right now. This doesn't cost me a thing. You know, the scripture is free. Salvation is free. And I think our Lord Jesus made his thoughts concerning this very clear when he took a whip into the temple and chased the money changers out of it, flipping over their tables, calling them names, exposing the heresy in what Jesus called the house of prayer. In very much the same way today, we've got people trying to make a quick buck off of God's children. And all that does is divert well-intended intended gifts to very evil conspirators, letting Satan steal God's blessings. I refuse to run to my subscribers, pulling their heartstrings to pay my bills because I decided to quit my job and play YouTube pastor full time. Just not going to happen, folks. I refuse to monetize my videos. And if you happen to see one of my videos that has ads on it, it's because it was forced upon me by these crazy copyright notices that come around. I have it's out of my control. They put ads on my videos without my permission. So you know I, I don't have a PayPal link I don't ever plan on adding one to my videos I refuse to charge money for preaching the gospel and I will do exactly what Paul did earn my own way and not be a burden upon my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus amen alright listen folks I'm doing what I do on YouTube because I have a genuine love for my brothers and sisters in Christ I'm doing this because I care and appreciate God's word rightly divided. I'm doing this because it makes me sick 
to see so many saints out there being lied to like I was. Being taken advantage of like I was. Being used and abused verbally like I was. I'm doing this not by my own strength, but by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit that indwells within me, instructs me, comforts me, and prompts me to spread the gospel of salvation to as many lost people as I possibly can while I'm still kicking and breathing on this planet come death or the rapture those are the only things that will keep me from moving forward Lord willing and for his glory and not my own and by his grace by his power and by his will and again for his glory I will continue to share and teach the essential understanding and importance of, her, of rightly dividing the Word of God. So moving on, concerning Paul and today's study. Uh, they say, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people out there saying that Paul it was a Gentile. Let me give you a short example of how this works. I'm my my heritage is is generally French okay and I live in the United States so as a French person if I moved to China and decided to live there and claim citizenship in China would that make me a Chinese would I be a Chinese if I moved to China and became a Chinese citizen in their country of course not I'd still be French, but I'd be living in China. And that's the same thing with Paul. Paul was a Jew through and through, and he had Roman citizenship. Folks, Roman is not a uh, genetic DNA lineage. Roman Romans had v different uh, types of people in that society, okay? And there are people on YouTube trying to convince their viewers with false teaching. And one such teaching is that Paul was a Gentile, like I said. There may be some of you watching that also think Paul was a Gentile and not a Jew. And it's extremely important that we understand just who Paul was. Because in doing so, it creates a pattern of dispensation, a dispensing of events that through right division reveals the truth of God's Word and completely refutes all the false teaching out there right now. So I'd like to take a moment again rightly divide God's Word and show you the proof, the facts, the scripture where Paul is mentioned as being a Jew through and through. If you will please open your King James Version Bibles to Philippians Philippians chapter 3 and my friends if you have a Bible please please go grab it and open it and because uh, there's gonna, actually in this study there's quite a bit of scripture that I'm going to be going through and in order for you to learn you really have to flip pages and see the words uh, and let it sink in so you can remember it and so you can get the uh, concepts down so if you have a Bible handy or maybe you can just go online look up uh, Bible Gateway has King James Version on it you can go there and do that but Philippians chapter 3 and also you can pause the video and get your Bible out that'll work too Philippians chapter 3 we read finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord okay let's stop there now remember the circumstances that Paul is writing in at this point okay he's in prison right next door to Nero's palace and the guards are uh, chain are, are forced to be chained to themselves and also to him okay the guards are chained to Paul to prevent his escape 
The guards were some of the most vicious Roman soldiers who had probably survived some of the greatest military campaigns ever. These were some folks, we're, we're talking UFC extreme fighter type of, type of people here, okay? These soldiers were, they meant business. Yet, after being chained to the Apostle Paul for maybe 24 hours, they became believers. And as we'll see again towards the end of the book, Paul's ministry actually penetrated right into the inner halls of the wicked man, Nero himself. So never forget that he's in prison, okay, uh, during this, this scripture here. And he's chained to a Roman guard. And yet, he records the fact that he was actively proclaiming and rejoicing in the Lord, okay? Continuing on, Philippians again, chapter 3. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now what Paul is saying here is that all these things just simply make sense to you not now now here comes a word of warning okay and it's just uh, as appropriate today as it was when he wrote it back uh, probably in 64 or 65 AD in Philippians uh, 3 the next verse it says beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the concision those who Paul is referencing here are the Judea Judaizers and their constant promotion of circumcision on the flesh to Paul's little congregation of grace believers now with that in mind let's read verse 3 for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh now this circumcision of course is a spiritual circumcision which he refers to in one of his other letters which is the cutting off of the old Adam and you and I as grace believers don't need the old Adam we have the new nature we're new creatures made by a spiritual circumcision one made without hands so Paul alone deals with that old Adam nature or as uh, we call it that old sin nature so Paul says beware of those things because we're not concerned about circumcision in the flesh but rather we're concerned about the spiritual circumcision which is something only God can do now let's move on into new ground in verse 4 though I might also have confidence in the flesh now you want to remember that whenever the Jews in Judaism promoted circumcision and keeping the commandments what were they emphasizing they were emphasizing the flesh it was what man could do of his own volition his own good works and we still see that today in the majority of religions don't we people trying to earn their way into heaven trying to go up another way trying to sneak in by their own means and unsuccessful they will be because there's only one way one access one door who is Christ Jesus alone and no one or nothing else See, that's as far as trusting in the flesh can go. It comes short in all aspects. Today, we're, we're not under the fleshly influence in this age of grace, but rather we're under the influence of the Spirit of God. We're in a whole new ball game, my friends. So looking at verse 4 again, <clears throat> Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, Okay, keep in mind that Paul is talking about being a good Jew here. And here, Paul gives seven reasons again why he, Paul, could boast in the flesh. Now, when I look 
at these things and I find seven and we have seven of them back in the book of Romans then again we have to be reminded of the complexities this the the inspired word of God presents us now Paul didn't sit down and rack his brain as he was writing and asking himself uh, how can I lay out seven things because seven is a nice number in scripture I don't think that's what entered Paul's mind at all but rather I think the Holy Spirit just let these things roll through his mind and they came off his uh, secretary's pen as he dictated his thoughts that were inspired directly by the Holy Spirit and written down accordingly it all just came rolling out and after the fact we have seven again God's perfect number and here they are in Philippians 3 verse 4 through 6 if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh I more now here they come circumcised the eighth day that's number one of the stock of Israel that's number two of the tribe of Benjamin that's number three and a Hebrew of Hebrews that's number four as touching the law a Pharisee that's number five concerning zeal persecuting the church or that assembly of believers up there in Jerusalem that's number six touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless blameless that's seven so we've got seven things that Paul had going for himself as a good Jew now notice in this verse coming up Paul counts all those things as dung okay D U N G in the King James uh, version Bible or trash might be a, a better word uh, or rubble okay uh, something that's not good all right but let's go back up to verses 4 5 and 6 and see what Paul is talking about here those things that he has so much going for him in the flesh as a good Jew and yet Paul says all of those fleshly things amount to nothing when it comes to the spirit looking again in Philippians 3 verse 4 though I might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh I more in other words at the time when he was a Judaizer Judaizer he was just about at the top of his game when it came to religious people okay they're just there just weren't any more religious than Saul of Tarsus and so he lists these seven things to 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 coincide with the position as a good religious Jew all right now look here chapter 3 verse 5 circumcise the eighth day according to the law that's what the law demanded to be circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel now that word stock okay when you chase it down do you know what that really implies Paul wasn't just a half Jew as a lot of people claim it wasn't just his father who was a Jew but both father and mother were Jews the Apostle Paul was a Jew through and through now keep all of this up in your brain because it's gonna come down to a boil when he says that he's chucked all of this so here you see a family who's one of the primary families of all Israel alright looking at verse 5 again with me of the tribe of Benjamin not many Jews okay at the time were able to trace their ancestries to a specific tribe they didn't have uh, ancestry.com on the internet all right but for some reason or other Saul of Tarsus had the ability to still trace his ancestry to the tribe of Benjamin Paul was highly educated folks he had access to top-of-the-line documentation 
in huge libraries that the common folk just didn't have access to. Paul knew what he was talking about when it came to his family's Jewish lineage. And back then, you had to be a Jew just to have access to the Jewish records. No Gentile or half Gentile was going into the Jewish library to seek out information about the lineage of the Benjamin tribe. That just wasn't going to happen. All right. So moving along to reiterate, Paul knew without a doubt that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now Benjamin as a tribe shall raven as a wolf. That's a verse. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. Does that ring a bell? Look, if you will, with me at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Genesis 49, 27. And we see Jacob is speaking. I'm sorry, folks. Taking some time here trying to get my... Okay. Genesis 49, verse 27. Jacob is the one that's speaking here. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Doesn't that sound like Jacob was talking about good old Saul of Tarsus? To me it does. I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that when the Lord inspired Jacob to say this, this was exactly what he had in mind. That there was a Benjamite, a, a, a Benjaminite, sorry, uh, coming that would fulfill this prophecy to the exact degree. In the morning, he shall devour the prey, his persecuting and how he ravaged Jewish believers and at night he shall divide the spoil <clears throat> you know what I think that is dividing the spoil at, at night he shall divide the spoil that's a reference to rewards that Paul was gonna receive up in glory one day for getting Christianity off the ground continuing on in verse 5 going back to Philippians chapter 3 Verse 5, we read a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, let's look at another verse over in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians eleven. All right, where he says almost the same exact thing. I always say that you know when Scripture repeats itself, whether it's within a verse or two or whether it's in a book or two, it's there for a purpose of repetition. And repetition is the key to learning, is it not? So we have to understand the context and makeup of this pack, uh, this passage in 2 Corinthians 11. In this verse, Paul's talking about the division that was taking place within the Corinthian church. Some said, uh, well, we're not going to follow that guy Paul. But rather, we follow Christ's early ministry teaching only. Others said, well, we're going to follow what Peter preaches. And then the others uh, only wanted to follow what Apollos taught. So Paul has, come, has to come back in 2 Corinthians, especially to defend his apostleship. That he was given to the Gentiles uh, you know from the Lord Jesus Christ himself and that he Paul is our example for the church age today as we'll see later on in Philippians 317 we'll see that 
exact thing. So, okay, so he's always defending his apostleship, his authority. And here is one of those situations. And after almost 2,000 years, Paul is still defending his apostleship, is he not? Even today, there's people out there who teach that Paul wasn't a Jew, uh, that he was a Gentile, and really didn't have any authority like Peter and the rest did. So they say disregard Paul and follow Peter. This is exactly what's taking place today in most denominations. And you'll notice one common thread between them all. False teaching. They all teach something contradictory to God's word. They all teach something that gives them the power over the people. Okay? They all teach something that gives them the edge over their people so they can take their money and run. That's basically what it boils down to, folks. The old saying, follow the money, is is accurate. And when you do follow the money, you find out a lot. You find a lot of answers that way. All right. So, okay. Now, now that I got that out, look with me, if you will, at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22 and 20, 22 and 23. Are they... Now, the word they, are they. Who is the they here? All these other leaders of the divisions, okay? Hebrews. So the verse, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. So where does that put Paul? It puts him head and shoulders above everybody else. He is the apostle of the Gentiles as declared in Romans 11.13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify, I magnify mine office. Let me read that again. Romans 11.13. <clears throat> For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now back in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 5, a Hebrew of Hebrews is touching the law. And remember, the law was fleshly, okay? What type of a religious Jew is, was Paul? He, he was a Pharisee. Now, for those of you who, <clears throat> who might not know what a Pharisee was, he was that uh, self-righteous person who pulled his robe around himself and said, Well, I don't commit sins. I'm above everybody else. You know, <clears throat> he's that type of person. I don't commit sins. I'm above all that type of, type of person. All right. And consequently, they, sh they, they showed their utter depravity in doing that. And that was Saul of Tarsus. He was a religious Jew to the hilt. He loved temple worship. He loved his Old Testament. But he loved it with a blind uh, ignorance. People today are exactly the same way. Oh, they're religious. They love their religion. They're sincere. And I, you know, I respect them for that. But there's one big problem. They're sincere, all right. They're sincerely wrong. And when Saul of Tarsus met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, he melted like hot butter, my friends. Why? Because all of a sudden, he was confronted with the same God that he thought he was trying to stamp out. And now, he's come back with an entirely new approach to his previous lifestyle. As a Jew of the Jews, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Now look at verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. The word church here, through translation, would be better read as persecuting the assembly. Now, I've learned through study that the word church isn't exactly always the same group of people. You know what? Uh, actually, let's... 
let me take a minute and explain why the word church doesn't always mean the same group of people because if there's anything that confuses the masses it's this one word and the word is ecclesia ecclesia isn't always translated as being church one place in acts it translates more correctly to assembly but see this assembly was a group of ephesian rioters okay they were pagans so they certainly weren't the church as in the church the body of Christ Jesus so the word church being the word ecclesia really translates to a called out assembly in other words a called out assembly is a group of people who are no longer a part of the masses but they've been separated from the masses they've been called out okay let's flip over uh, to Acts chapter 7 and I'll show you what I'm talking about Acts chapter 7 Acts chapter 7 All right, and let's see. And you know, I I really believe uh, this is what Paul's talking about here when he tells us to rightly divide the scriptures. You really have to go uh, searching through the Bible and rightly divide scriptures. It's just, we're this is a perfect example. You know, the word church may not mean the church as the church today, the body of Christ. Uh, the word ecclesia can mean a called out assembly it can mean uh, a church it can be it could be uh, several things so let's take a look at this acts chapter 7 uh, let's see and also you know don't just take uh, the word church and consider it uh, as the same group by rightly dividing we discover that the word ecclesia can mean uh, like I said more than one thing so it's important to rightly divide and here's the proof of that I can't uh, reiterate that enough folks rightly right division is everything here in this passage Stephen is rehearsing Israel's history okay and he takes it all the way back to the call of Abraham and now he's at a point where they're they're coming out of Egypt Acts 7 verse 36 in Acts 7 verse 36 and it reads he brought them out now he <coughs> is uh, Moses okay so he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs to the land of Egypt and to the Red Sea and in the in the wilderness 40 years now in verse 37 this speaking of Christ now in his fulfillment of the the mosaic type is that Moses okay which said unto the children of Israel a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear verse 38 this is he he speaking of Jesus of Nazareth the crucified Christ that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us in other words all the way up through the Old Testament whenever there's a person in the Godhead speaking or dealing with some element of humanity who was it it was God the Son right this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear here we see that the only way Moses knew what to say is by the Lord God the Son telling him by prompting by prompting him 
what to say in his thoughts. All right. Now look at uh, verse 38 again. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Here we see, uh, we see the word church that was in the wilderness. But isn't, isn't the same thing as the church today? Or uh, quote the New Testament church, is it? No, of course not. So we see here that by rightly dividing the word church can mean more than what we assume it means today. Rightly dividing is key, folks. I cannot stress that enough. And I'm going to be stressing that out. I'm going to be stressing it all through these eight videos. So by the time we're done, hopefully you, you are rightly dividing. And I guarantee you, if you uh, follow along with all of everything that I'm doing and, and teaching with you, taking the time to show you all this stuff, you're going to come out the other end of the eight videos a different person the light bulb is going to click on for you and you're going to say wow now now it makes sense now I understand the Bible yeah you know just trust me but follow along with me you know I've heard one guy definitely a false teacher okay uh, the denomination I can't remember but he tried to make this church in the wilderness the New Testament church. And he tried desperately. He twisted every scripture you can think of just to make it fit. But it just won't fit because the church here in the wilderness just isn't the New Testament church. Knowing what we know now, we know it's a called out assembly. The word ecclesia. In this situation means called out assembly and it also means church and that's why we're rightly dividing to figure out what's going on here okay um, so knowing what we know now we know it's a called out assembly but of what kind of people what kind of people were that assembly in in the wilderness who were the people that were considered the church in the wilderness they were all Jews so this assembly that was called out of Egypt is the nation of Israel under Moses' uh, leadership. And here the word ecclesia, instead of being translated church, should have been translated to a called out assembly because that's what Israel was. Let's look at another real quick example in Acts chapter 2. Just a few pages back. Acts chapter 2. And this is also, this also is uh, miscontext, if that's a word. And it's interchanged with what Paul calls the church, which is his body. Okay, but you see Acts chapter 2 doesn't include the words, which is his body, because it's not. Now, here in Acts chapter 2, we have the Jewish uh, feast. The feast day of Pentecost that's going on. And let's look at verse 47. Acts 2, verse 47. Now, here in Acts 2, 47, the feast is going on. And we read, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It would have been so much better if the translator would have used a called out assembly here, but rather he used church because these Jews were called out from the masses of Jews who had rejected Jesus of Nazareth. But this little assembly of believers had recognized him for, for, you know, what he was. He was the Christ, the Messiah. And that's all Peter proclaimed to them that day. <clears throat> so this called out assembly cannot uh, be called the church, which is his body. 
and it doesn't call it that but rather it just simply says and the Lord added to the church ecclesia or the Lord added to that called out assembly of Jews people that were becoming believers all right now let's look at one more which really shakes this translation thing up and uh, that would be in Acts chapter 19 flipping over to cha uh, Acts chapter 19 course here we're in Ephesus and the reason of Paul's preaching was that there were many idolaters becoming believers and they were throwing away all their idols and literally uh, wreaking havoc on the businesses of the idol makers uh, silver craftsmen and people profiting from those types of businesses so he's literally causing a riot here in Ephesus Acts 19 29 through 32 and the whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus men of Macedonia Paul's companions in travel they rushed with one accord into the theater now can you picture this now those theaters back in ancient times had doors much like our uh, football stadiums today so I can just see this huge mass of people just filing into that open air theater, okay? Just to just kind of picture that. Now in verse 30, and when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples, his followers, uh, certainly not the twelve, suffered him not. Verse 31, and certain of the chief, uh, I'm sorry, and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends sent unto him desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater some therefore cried one thing and some another for the ecclesia assembly was confused for the assembly was confused in this situation here we see the word ecclesia again here they translated it assembly but they could have just used the word church both the word ecclesia just as well okay it, it, it would mean it they could have inter 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 uh changed those two things right there it, it would have been no more evident uh invidious as the called out jews from egypt or the called out jews from pentecost so here was an example of how to chase down words and realize that they don't always mean the same thing. Rightly dividing God's word is the only means of correctly understanding the scriptures, folks. There's just no other way around it. And if you want to be confused, just look at the Bible as one big book that applies to all of us at all times, in all places, for all people, with no difference at all. And I guarantee you, you'll end up in one form of cult or another down the road mark my words so at this point I think you'll agree that there's no doubt that Paul was a Jew a Jews Jew a Hebrew of Hebrews he was circumcised on the eighth day yeah a, a Pharisee Paul was educated in Jewish matters he, he moved up the the Pharisee ladder my friends there's no way that the Jews would have allowed Gentiles to perform Jewish traditional worship in the temple if Paul was Jew a Gentile. I mean, it just it just wouldn't happen. There's no way. And again, you know, I go back to my example from earlier. I'm a I'm a Frenchman living in the United States. If I move to China and become a Chinese citizen, that doesn't make me Chinese. All right, it won't change me into a Chinese person. I, I will still be a Frenchman, but I'll be a Chinese citizen. Paul was a Jew, so was his father and mother, both Jews. They were uh, from the lineage of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. So there is no question when you rightly divide the Word of God and you actually read the Bible 
and do some study, you find out the truth. Paul was a Jew. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. He wasn't a Gentile apostle. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. So now that we, you know, understand that Paul was a big part of, uh, he was a big part in Judaism, we can move along and discover how the scriptures, the scripture was written, by who, for what reason, to who, and why, and so on. Now, the first statement I'd like to make for your consideration is that the Bible was written by Jews, for Jews, to Jews, about Jews, okay? The only exceptions are the epistles of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle of the Gentiles, again, Roman eleven thirteen, not Paul who was the Gentile Apostle, but Paul, the Apostle for the Gentiles, it's clear that Paul was a Jew, and he always went to the Jews first when traveling on missionary journeys, but his message was given to him by the risen Christ. Okay? His message wasn't given to him by an angel. Or, you know, Paul, while traveling, didn't stumble upon a cave and find some uh, scrolls with a neat little mystery to reveal to a bunch of people he'll call the body of Christ. That's just not how it worked. The risen Christ is the one that revealed all these things to Paul directly okay it's important to understand that so you know it, it was given to him by the risen Christ for the time that we live in now that's today my friends the dispensation of the body of Christ this time that we're talking about known as the age of grace I'll be getting into uh, the details about this a little later so don't let it trip you up just you know right now or confuse you at this point it'll become more clear as we move along in uh, the series of the of this study so there are several keys to learning scripture how to study it and what it means and <clears throat> one of these keys and clues is in the first in the very first book the first chapter and the first verse Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth from this we find out right up front that God created two different spheres okay and we're gonna learn a little later that God has a program for each of these spheres alright now you know the funny thing is most people including most Christians are unaware of this one important fact that there's actually two spheres there's the heaven and the earth the reason is except for Paul's epistles the rest of the Bible is only about one of these spheres okay namely the earthly program which was to for and about the Jews our Lord God created the heaven and the earth notice that it's heaven and not heavens with an S okay another clue that will be important to recall later on so keep it in the back of your mind as we're moving along here also note that God had a program for the heavenly sphere, uh, sphere right from the start all right but he kept it a secret until much later when he reveals it to the Apostle Paul after only after the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah in fact the crucifixion had uh, if the crucifixion had never taken place things would most likely be very very different today if you're unfamiliar with the specifics concerning uh, the crucifixion don't worry because we'll be getting into that a little bit deeper later on but at this point in our study I think it's a uh, this is a good time to offer some logical and common sense rules for studying God's Word all right since hopefully you'll be hopefully you'll soon be reading and, and studying you know the Bible for yourself so the first rule is to ascertain who is speaking 
in scripture okay now before I go any further let me state that the entire Bible was actually written by God the Holy Spirit all right but it was penned or written by about 40 different men who were Jews over a period uh, of about 1500 years and since several of these men wrote more than one book there's a total of 66 books okay and 66 is an interesting number because uh, the number six represents man and, be, and man was created on the sixth day so <clears throat> you know it's kind of interesting that there's 66 books I mean that kind of it spells in your it's an in your face saying hey this book is for mankind this is your manual this these are instructions this is for you you know so uh, 66 is interesting but there's 66 books and what we know uh, as the Bible today and I'm speaking exclusively exclusively about the King James Version Bible itself okay because there's many several different uh, versions out there and uh, my suggestion is <clears throat> honestly stay away from them because if you compare the King James Version Bible to the let's say the NIV or the AS uh, American Standard Version or the other ones if you you can go online and type in KJV uh, versus NIV differences or changes and you can pull up a list and go through verse by verse and see that there are many verses in the King James Version Bible that are completely removed from the other ones I mean they're not even in there and it, all the other verses are just changed in such a way that the meaning is gone or lost okay and this is being done on purpose folks this these new versions of Bibles is to hide information they don't want everybody knowing especially how to rightly divide especially understanding who Paul was especially understanding that Paul was given a mystery a secret gospel from Jesus Christ himself they don't want you to know that stuff all they want you to be concerned about is following what Peter and the others taught in the four Gospels okay that's what they want you to do and that's what religion teaches religion teaches the law the religion keeps people under the law alright and they steer away from Paul and the gospel of grace our our gospel for today they steer away from it that's why I'm taking the time making these videos because it's so important and it was such a blessing when I finally understood this information I was in Christ I was saved over 30 let's see I was saved over 30 years and uh, you know after 30 years of being confused having questions all the time I finally discovered how to rightly divide and started learning about dispensation starting learning about Paul's gospel for us today and when I finally understood that it clicked the light bulb came on and I fell to my knees I started crying and I was so happy because I finally understood the Bible I finally understood the the prophecies our, our future prophets I understood what Daniel 70 is is for I understood where the Jews fit in I understood the difference between the the church and the, the Jews and the programs and all these things and it was such a blessing folks so please stay 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 with me in these videos in these studies and and uh, you know there's several more videos coming so stay with me and follow along in your Bible as much as you can that's all I can say uh, in any case however the interesting thing about the Bible is uh, though it's written by so many different authors guided by the Holy Spirit you won't find 
if you study the Bible properly, okay, you won't find any contradictions or errors whatsoever in its pages. Na, none. Nada. Zip. And I'm talking about the, the King James Version only, okay? And this is proof of its supernatural properties. Proof that only the supernatural, a supernatural being, our Lord God, could have written it. Proof that the the one and only author is our Lord God. Now, the second rule is, who are they speaking to? Who is the audience or person being spoken to? In other words, are they talking to the Jews? Are they talking to the Gentiles? Are they talking to both? Or maybe uh, they're only speaking to one individual. This is very important. Since many people don't take this into consideration when studying the Bible and therefore they make the mistake of uh, making things apply to themselves when they do not apply. Okay, And all false teaching stems from not following the simple rules that I'm listing for you right now. So please list them down and remember them. It's like reading someone else's mail as an example. All right. And, and trying to make letters and information to and for someone else apply to you. It just doesn't work. You end up following another person's program, okay? For example, let's say I have uh, my fr a friend and his name is George, okay? And my, f my friend George's wife writes to him, all right? She writes him a love letter and tells him that she loves him in this letter okay but since you're reading my friend George's mail you believe what his wife is saying applies to you and now you think George's wife loves you instead the fact however she wasn't writing or speaking to you in the first place you see when you don't rightly divide you end up reading someone else's mail and thinking it's for you and you run into all kinds of problems like that now the third rule is what are they speaking about as you can see from the example of George's uh, love letter from his wife and her love for him her love for for George is all well and good and it might be good for you to know about it especially since you made the mistake of assuming she was writing to you and thinking a married woman is potentially being unfaithful to her husband can you see how things can get really messed up quickly by not asking the simple the this simple rule question uh, these questions of who what why where and how and so forth this is how you rightly divide if you if you can remember anything out of this study remember this one specific thing before you read the Bible while you're reading the Bible ask yourself who is writing it what's it being written written for why is it being written where is it being written uh, to who is it being written to who's writing it and so forth all right if you can remember that one thing you'll 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 go far with this the next thing and the final key in this video is that you need to keep what you read in context and also in chronological order okay now God is an orderly being in fact God is a perfect being unable to make mistakes and always able to provide truth without error keeping in mind that what may seem as an error or perhaps a contradiction to you somewhere down the line as you're reading the Bible is actually due to misunderstanding not using the keys that I've just mentioned to you here today so not rightly dividing God's Word is the source of all false teaching did you get that it's not rightly dividing the word is the source of all false teaching rightly dividing is really 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 that important keep in mind 
that some books overlap and some books actually uh, weren't written in the order in which they appear in the Bible. Therefore, it'd be wise to consider the order that they were written and context when studying and reading God's Word. Now, in closing, I want you to open your Bibles to two places. And this is your homework. And I want you to take a good look at these two scriptures while you're waiting for the next study video all right so you can do some research the first book I want you to look at is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 Ephesians 1 verse 10 Ephesians 1 verse number 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven there's that one sphere and which are on earth there's that other sphere remember a while ago I was talking about the two spheres in the beginning Genesis 1 1 God created the heaven and the earth he created two spheres so with that in mind let's read this again that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him all right now the second scripture I want you to take a look at the second book is Colossians 1 Colossians 1 verse 25 Colossians 1 verse 25 whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God let's read that again whereof I am made a minister this is Paul speaking now he's saying I am made a minute who made Paul the minister who came down to Paul and gave Paul all the, the uh, information about the mystery gospel, about the heavenlies, about all these things that Paul saw. That they, and then he, he said he, they were so awesome that he couldn't even talk about it. The, our Lord Jesus Christ revealed to Paul amazing things, folks. And it's not all in the Bible. There are things we just don't know. But Paul wrote, specifically his doctrine the scripture that Paul received was from Jesus Christ and he was made a minister to that gospel now continuing on according to the dispensation this according to the dispensation another way to read that according to the dispensing of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God all right so those two books and verses Ephesians 1 10 and Colossians 1 25 go ahead and read those on your uh, own time as homework because they're gonna come into play again in the future now mark these two scriptures down and save them look at them uh, like I said in the time we have before the next video publishes and uh, Make special note to word disp to uh, the word dispensation, and notice that Colossians says given to me, for you, me being Paul, you being the body of Christ. Okay, the body of let's, let's keep that clear. Given to me for you, and you is clearly the body of Christ here. All right. So with that said, um, that's it for part two I hope you followed along and I hope uh, you were edified by this study and I pray that uh, that through this study you'll understand how to rightly divide understand uh, the dispensing of God's programs to us and ultimately I pray that it would bring comfort to you so that you don't have to worry about 
your salvation and you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to get into heaven when the time comes. All right. So thank you for watching and studying God's word with me today. May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be unto you and your families. I'll see you next time, saints. Ooh.